thank goodness it's Friday. This month, our episode is brought to you by the mystery cache type. Mystery caches, also called unknown caches, can provide a whole host of experiences, but at the most basic level, they are geocaches where there's likely nothing at the posted coordinates and something must be done to determine the location of the geocache container and log sheet. It might be a puzzle to solve from the listing, or a puzzle to solve in the field, and the geocache itself could be up to two miles away, or even right in your own hand. That part's unknown. Well, at least until you know. <laughs> this is TGIF Geocaching Radio, a podcast with a monthly dose of geocaching news and adventure, contests and hot topics, and highlighting many experiences that may await you. And I'm Jeff, aka The Bruce Zero, so stay tuned and let's hang out. Hello! I hope you've had a great month. It's been pretty quiet for me, unless you count the flurry of souvenirs to earn from Geocaching HQ. But we'll get to that later. Though I did recently cross my 20,000th smiley milestone. <laughs> and that brings up an interesting little point. Um, I can usually plan finds to line up so that I can actually say, while signing the geocaches, This is my milestone find! But these days we've got adventure labs that can throw a curveball into that timing. So I don't typically log right away, making use of the drafts feature so I can sit down at my computer and type up better logs than I would live on my phone. That means I could find 20 caches where the 20th should be the milestone find, but without logging them live, if I also find adventure locations in between, since those are tracked live, my milestone find would be off a few smileys once I get to composing those drafts. So thankfully we have the option to lock in a specific find for a milestone. If you don't know how to do that, here's a quick tip how. From your profile dashboard on geocaching.com, just go to your statistics page and then find the milestones tab. You'll see the nice list of round numbers and which cache logs line up with those finds. They'll be locked or unlocked. So you'll want to hit the pencil to edit the milestone you want to fix, then choose the proper cache. And once saved, it'll show as locked in place. Milestones really are just a minor thing, but they're a fun way to highlight memories, however you may wish. As for summer plans, regretfully I've had to cancel my maritime mega event trip. <laughs> for multiple reasons. So the workshop topic that I'd love to share about, uh, about tips and tales from the road, it'll need to be held off for another date. Uh, as will the road trip that I was really looking forward to enjoying out east. And it also means Canada's oldest geocache, GCBBA, We'll need to hold tight once again until my next chance to visit out east to Nova Scotia and beyond. But July is also bringing the next big thing, and that's the launch of my first official geocoin from Cash the Line. So if you're watching the social medias, you'll have seen teaser shorts posted over the last few weeks, showcasing the styles of geocoin variants and giving a taste of what's to come with Project EGA. <laughs> Patron supporters got an exclusive updated peek at the plans, and uh, more details will be forthcoming this year, but you will be able to find the geocoin crowdfunding project on Indiegogo once July arrives. So watch for the announcements. But now, let's dive in to review what's happened this month officially in geocaching from HQ. We are approaching the end of the Wheel of Challenges challenge number three, Out and About. This month our goal was to find caches on as many days as we could to earn up to three souvenirs for five days, for ten days, and for twenty days. By the looks of things, hard was actually hard for a lot of people, again, and with only a few days left, hopefully, if you haven't accomplished 20 days, you still could. Log a geocache, complete an adventure location, or attend an event to mark a day qualified towards this challenge. If you want an easy check to see how many days you've got, a Project GC Checker was created to help, which will be linked in the episode notes. To make this month even more hectic, HQ offered a new Solstice souvenir for finding 21 geocaches between June 18th and 24th. That's a full week overlap with the Out and About challenge. 
Were you able to earn 21 smileys in that one week? <laughs> it might be a tough challenge for anyone living away from a populated area or who's found all their nearby geocaches, but I guess that's the same with any souvenir, really. You can't earn them all, though. Maybe they should start calling them something other than souvenirs. <laughs> We've also just learned the fourth challenge for July 3rd through August 6th. If you thought 20 days of fines throughout June and 21 caches in one week wasn't enough, we now have a legitimate streak challenge for this next period. For this souvenir, you can earn the easy level by finding caches two days in a row, <laughs> the medium level with seven days in a row, and with a big leap to hard by finding a geocache for at least four weeks straight. That's 28 consecutive days. That's finding a cache, attending an event, or completing adventure stops. Once again, it seems like a challenge that's either love it or hate it, but one thing's for sure, it's helping people feel that itch to get out and earn some smileys. Personally, I'm not sure if I'll be able to, but I'm going to try. Plans in the middle of July might cut that potential streak right down the middle, making it impossible for me, but we'll see. Geocaching HQ has announced that in January of 2024, we will be seeing another round of virtual caches, Virtual Rewards 4.0. Over recent years, HQ has been helping freshen the virtual cache game board by doling out limited amounts of this legacy cache type, hoping that those who receive the reward would put extra effort into creating a reasonably quality virtual cache listing. This type is still super rare, but this will be another opportunity for geocachers to hopefully receive one and be able to publish one. I received one in the second round of rewards, which I published at the tallest publicly accessible fire tower in Canada, GC88ZP8, and I did a live stream video from the cupola at the top, feeling its sway in the wind. If you receive a new virtual reward, where would you place it? What would you want to highlight? You know, on second thought, you may not want to tell anyone, or someone else might place it first. This round, there's no opt-in process. Geocachers will be informed if they receive one based on the criteria for qualification. The announcement reads, you must have a non-event geocache published in 2023 that has earned at least four favorite points by December 31st, 2023. You must have created your geocaching account before June 13th, 2023, and prior virtual reward recipients are eligible to participate. Players who opted in for a virtual reward 2.0 and 3.0, but did not receive a virtual cache, will have a higher likelihood to receive a virtual reward 4. 4,000 geocaches will be chosen on January 17th based on those criteria to receive one virtual cache listing to publish within a year. Good luck! So, it looks like this round they are favoring very recent and active cache owners who are making at least a tiny bit of effort to add to the game board with at least one thoughtful cache hide this year. Even if you're a loyal veteran geocacher with many hides and oodles of favorites, you'll still need to place a geocache in 2023 and earn a few favorite points. And that's just to qualify. Undoubtedly, there will again be way more than 4,000 qualified geocachers, so many will still likely not receive a virtual to publish, but at least we'll be getting a new batch, and hopefully you'll have at least a handful to find reasonably close to take you to a wonderful place you've never seen before. There are a handful of large events that are available for you, for you to attend if you're in the area, and this month we have got Cash Fest in Tennessee, that's July 15th. We've got Midwest Geobash in Ohio on July 22nd, and we've got the Maritime Mega in New Brunswick on July 8th. But worldwide, we've also got a mega event in Slovakia, two in Germany on the 1st and 8th. We've got Pirate Mania 15 in the UK on the 29th, and unfortunately, once again, there's no Giga events coming up in July or this year so far. Now, Geo Woodstock 19 in Owensboro, uh, Kentucky just finished, and they announced Geo Woodstock XX, the 20th Geo Woodstock for next year in 2024, and it's taking place in Flagstaff, Arizona. Now, you can visit the, uh, the listing, the Giga event listing for that. It has been published. It's at GCA6GW6. And if you think you're going to attend next year, then get over there and post your will attend. Let them know so that they can help already start to plan the event and uh, have an idea of how many people are hoping to attend. It's still a year out, but that don't matter. Let them know as soon as you think you might even go. Work out the plans later.
All right, we have a new idea for something fun that we can participate in worldwide coming soon. And here to tell us about this plan is Deadliest Cashers, creator of geocachingcentral.com. So tell us, Nancy, what are you trying to get the geocaching community to do in September? Well, um, it's called the Pirate Project. And um, my hope is that we can have a worldwide publication of pirate-themed geocaches on September 19th, which is Talk Like a Pirate Day. Ah, that's the significance of September 19th. <laughs> yes. Well, what I did was, um, I thought, I'm, I'm an avid hider. If, you, if you're going to say, what's my superpower in geocaching? It's not finding geocaches. It's, hi it's hiding them. Mm -hmm. And um, I always wanted to do something like this. And when this Maker Magic project came up, um, I had an event that was like a kickoff for the Pirate Project. And then after we had the um, live event, I started um, sending out invitations to associations, uh, Facebook groups, um, vloggers, bloggers podcasts, anybody that would um, help me spread the word, because I'd like this to be worldwide. Yeah, and and uh, I think the pirate theme was also uh, pretty popular. Was it last year with Going Caching, or was it this year? Uh, actually, Going Caching pirate theme was in 2019. Oh, wow, time flies. <laughs> yeah, 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 because I, I had been to that Going Caching. And um, I picked a pirate theme because... It's just, it's something fun. And um, it was in hopes of getting people or encouraging people to create something that is clever or unique. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't, don't know how to do that. So if you give them a theme, then they can work on a specific, you know, the specific theme to do that. Yeah, right. And so are you... Uh requesting that people create any type of cache, any type of geocache? Yeah, essentially it's there there's there's not that many there's no restrictions on it. You can pick the size, the shape, you can pick the type of cache. It can be a multi cache. You can do an adventure lab with a bonus cache at the end that's pirate themed. Anything you want. Or a long paddle cache where you got to uh, uncover a big chest of gold, maybe. Yeah. Hey, it works for me. <laughs> yeah. Go nuts um, with the idea. Yeah. And then w the only stipulation is, is that you have it published on um, September 19th. Hmm. And if you go to the Pirate Project um, website page, it explains how to speak to your reviewer and explain to them what you're doing so that they can set it up for you. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a little logo that you can put at the bottom of your cash page that will identify you as being in the pirate project. And then also, um, Oh, what's the last thing we want? You? Oh, we want, I want you to have the word pirate somewhere mm -hmm. in the title just to, keep everything identified. So will you also be creating a official bookmark list of all of the <laughs> pirate yes. caches? Um, <laughs> yes, if you read the uh, yeah, if you read the pirate uh, the information on the page after your geocache is published on the 19th, you will email me the GC number and I will put together a bookmark of every um, geocache that participated in this. And I will also send every geocacher a digital souvenir that they can put um, on their geocaching.com profile page. Uh, I was just about to ask about that. Did you uh, think about trying to reach out to HQ to see if there could be a souvenir? But that was probably not going to be very fruitful. <laughs> right, right. I, uh, you know, um, HQ has a lot of ideas of their own, mm. as does the geocaching community and you know, they, um, um, again, me being an avid hider, I wish there was more things that they promoted for hiding. Um, but they have increased that in, in the past years. Mm -hmm. So um, I can't complain. 
Right, right. Now, can people also create events, pirate-themed events on the same day? Sure. In fact, I'm going to have a pirate-themed event um, that day also, um, because if all goes well, there's going to be uh, a heck of a lot of geocaches that are published that day. <laughs> yep. I can only imagine how much the uh, map is going to blow up with this worldwide series of geocaches <laughs> w wouldn't that be neat <laughs> i wonder if it if it might end up being able to rival the uh church micro series which i think is the self-proclaimed largest geocache series in the world right now <laughs> yeah that's that is a over in europe they do have several different um series like that the church micro um, they also have one that's called sidetracked, where yeah. you put ca geocaches in uh, near trains and train stations. Maybe that's the largest. I think the the sidetracked yeah. series. I think that's well. The one. You know what it is is you can. Um, I, in fact, I have three sidetracked uh, geocaches published um, throughout my area, and um, I, it would be nice to get more of the United States involved. But um, I think. Train stations are a little bit more popular in Europe because a lot of people commute through train yeah. um, versus car. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, this would be a great opportunity, I think, for people to be creative. And, uh, you know, there was there, there was the virtual 4.0 that was just announced as uh, being as coming out next year in January. And uh, one of the requirements for that was to have a cache published in 2023 with at least four favorite points. So <laughs> this, this could is... be a, yeah, this could be a great opportunity for geocachers to get that, that geocache out in the field that they would get the four favorite points. Yeah. A good opportunity to get uh, another mm -hmm. chance to get a, a virtual cache if you haven't had one already, especially, but I mean, yeah. this is a great creative opportunity. And uh, so I think it'd be, it would definitely be really neat to see the result of this come uh, late September to see how creative people are and, uh, you know, whether they just put a, a skull and crossbones on a micro container out in the woods or whether they create this really cool, elaborate gadget cache sort of adventure, multi-stages and all that. I mean, we, I think we see a lot more of that over in Europe. Um, a lot of those more immersive types of type of adventures, but um, uh -huh. yeah, hopefully it'll in inspire people yeah. to be more yeah. creative and, and create this really cool themed pirate cache. Yeah, I mean there the um, on the web page there's some suggested ideas just to you know get your brain jump started, mm -hmm. and also there will be there is a section on the um, the page where you can send in your created container and it will be displayed on the page so that'll give people um ideas to look at too nice so an, an inspiration gallery <laughs> yes yes well that is a, a really cool idea i'll include the link to the website and the web page for information in the show mm -hmm. notes so if you're interested then you can just check that out and you'll have all the information that you need to get started and be creative and uh, prepare for September 19th, 2023, the Pirate Project Day. <laughs> and don't forget to talk like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Nancy. Okay, thanks for having me. Ever want to show off your path tag art in a way that people can remember? Arted Crafted Tees can create a t-shirt for you as easily as sending over your path tag ID and two weeks later your t-shirt order will arrive. It's a fun way to have a signature item at events and you can even make it trackable for people to discover. Head over and peruse the store, find a gift or two or treat yourself. Thanks to Arted Crafted for sponsoring the show. They've got an enormous collection of all sorts of geocaching themed paraphernalia available to order at articcrafted.com. You may find Arted Crafted at mega events and merch areas where you'll be able to peruse the smorgasbord of designs they have. But right now, go visit that store at artedcrafted.com and freshen up your wardrobe a bit. And to check out the epic tea design that feels so excellent geocaching adventure visit cachetheline.net slash epic tea, E-P-I-C-T-E-E, -E, or just go directly to artedcrafted.com.
So last month we found out that a very rare and famous coin, the second one ever made, number 002, had caused a stir by being put up for sale on eBay for 5,500 US dollars. Word was that the coin was purchased to be put back into circulation properly instead of being used for profit. And well, during Geo Woodstock that weekend, we got to see and hear the full story. Joshua Johnson, the geocaching vlogger, was on hand to witness the coin being passed from the possession of Neon Cacher, who repurchased it, to its owner, Geocoin Granddaddy Mountain Bike. Not only that, Mountain Bike, John Stanley, gave to him as thanks the oldest of his own coins he still owned, number 20. What is your name, sir? Neon Cacher. Neon Cacher, and he's got something very special um, to give to John. Take it away. This what is that? is mountain bike coin number two and that is significant because because john and jeremy in october of 2001 september i believe 29th. September, september 29th end of september tell the story uh you were so there. i won wanted to do something special for my hundredth find and it's like hey mint some some coins because i wanted a signature item and a cashier in washington said hey told me the whole idea of challenge coins so Came out with the idea of coins. Jeremy and I went to a very, very cool cache uh, uh, near north, north of Seattle. And that was the first one that ever went into circulation. That was the first one I ever put in a cache. It was picked up almost immediately and disappeared from the world. Wow. But <laughs> it resurfaced and I made sure I could get it to give back to John and the geocaching world so wow and i'm going to take it and put it in the museum at hq so everybody can visit it and log it it's meant to be seen by people please only log it if you really see it though that's one of my rules <laughs> and it's um, in the original bag it's yeah, still in the original wow. bag because it just didn't go anywhere after the first person took it and then dropped out of caching so um and so are. to thank him in a small way it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, quite uh, add up, but uh, I'm. I had number twenty given back to me by a oh. cashier, so I'm giving him the oldest one I have wow. for him to take. And as as a tiny token of thanks, I owe him so much. <laughs> you don't owe me anything. Yes, I do. No, you yes, don't. But now the rest of the world shortly will be able to visit this in Seattle, log it, and enjoy what I meant it to be, which is Correct. to be shared. So. Wow. How cool is that? A geocaching community coming together. That's awesome. Way to go. So Good job, guys. To this guy. How about that? <laughs> John will be admitting geocoin number 002 into the museum at Geocaching HQ. Number 001 is still in his personal possession. And if you ever meet John in person, likely at a mega event somewhere, you'll be permitted to hold it and discover it, along with all of the other trackable items he has with him. <laughs> so big thanks to Neon Casher for doing what was necessary to get a hold of that coin and get it back where it belongs. It belongs in a museum! What would you do if you were hiking to a geocache that was recently found, but you came across a no trespassing sign? It's a question geocachers probably face pretty regularly, and maybe too often. <laughs> if it happens to me, the first thing I do is check the map, see if there's a way around, or if the cache looks like it's inside the private area. Then I'd check the listing to see if there's a known or permitted route to the cache, or to see if there's permission to actually get to the cache, though that's still feeling odd if there's no recognition in front of me that some way geocachers are permitted. Then I'd check the log to see what others thought. Did they see the sign? Is it new? Did they trespass anyway? Does the cash owner even know? Of course, some regions may be uh, much more touchy about land than others. Say, down south United States where an owner could come running at you with a gun versus a vast forest in northern Ontario with no one around for many, many kilometers. But even then, I think the best course of action is to either DNF it or post a note explaining the dilemma so the cache owner can decide what to do, and other geocachers would be aware as well. But beyond that, I think it's important to realize that land ownership can change, and the cache owner didn't necessarily trespass when the geocache was originally placed, or ownership may change hands, and where permission used to be granted, the new owners have no idea about the agreement. 
So really the cash owner should absolutely be made aware and maybe add the listing to your watch list to see how they follow up. In the rarest of cases, the CO may not care and that puts other geocaches at risk. It may be necessary to post uh, needs reviewer attention to deal with the issue. Geocaching HQ is typically very responsive to land ownership concerns. If a landowner contacts HQ, quite often there'd simply be an immediate archival from HQ on the listing. If it gets resolved by the owner, then it could be retracted, but geocaching sh should not and does not condone trespassing. So the safest action is always to shut it down until any dispute or misunderstanding could be resolved. But what happens if someone claims to be the landowner without evidence that they are? Geocaching.com is a listing service and doesn't own the geocaches that are other people's property, so they're dealing worldwide with land they don't own and physical property they don't own. In odd cases, it may be an irate geocacher with a beef that tattles on another geocacher wanting to cause headaches, or a landowner may be mistaken about what is public land and what's their own private land. In those cases, there could be a hard call to make. You trust the whistleblower and halt access to the cache listing, because HQ can't physically stop people from trespassing, or trust the cache owner that everything is cleared to be as is. If HQ archives the cache, someone still needs to get the physical container, and that usually means the landowner, who may already have retrieved or destroyed it, or the cache owner could effectively choose to trespass to go get it. <laughs> In the end, I think if we run into this kind of situation, remember that Geocaching HQ and all of the volunteer reviewers simply play the role of a middleman. They don't know the immediate situation, they can only make calls based on what they hear from those involved. So don't jump down their throats. <laughs> if you know there's a misunderstanding, just communicate that clearly, but remember the geocachers are people, and the best option to reduce risk to them is almost always to just let it go and walk away, especially when dealing with non-geocachers and potential legal issues or potential future encounters that could go south very quickly. <laughs> A good example of a recent land change is an old geocache in the boonies of eastern Ontario near Ottawa. The Rideau Trail is a long public trail that's been around many, many years, and a geocache posted at a ghost town found along the trail, an oldie published in 2002, GC8E2C. It looks like an amazing experience, but the Trail Association posted that the land surrounding a segment of the trail, including the just 150 meter stretch at one end, from the road through to the ghost town had changed ownership and they're restricting access and much to their disappointment given how much fun they've had with that trail and its upkeep. Word got to the geocaching community who realized that this old geocache would now be inaccessible. It was 2002 and a very cool location. But what could be done? I mean, well, at best, perhaps the cache owner could negotiate with the landowner to permit trail access to the cache. It's not a long stretch. But chances are the owners may also restrict road access through the forest to even get anywhere near the trail. And well, if that happens, sadly, that's the end of the road for this golden oldie. But that's how the hobby works. Geocaches don't last forever. So get them while you can. Enjoy every walk, drive, bike, sight, and smell and adventure that you can while it's still available. And when we lose those geocaches to time and change, Simply bid them so long and thanks for all the fish. I've got a handful of adventures to highlight this month, but it's just a drop in the bucket of what's out there to experience in geocaching. Anyway, first off, there is a geocache still near and dear to my heart, which I found in 2009, only months after I began geocaching. It's a five difficulty and five terrain geocache that's placed by the DAC girls, which I targeted towards my first fizzy. I was in San Diego that year for a convention, uh, as well as Comic-Con, and before flying there, I'd seen this 5-5, five five, adding it to my must-do-if-possible list, because I was trying to complete a special challenge. The friends I was with at the time were not geocachers, but seemed interested on going on this adventure. The cache is GCWD13. Tomb Raider. <laughs> its posted location is downtown San Diego, and you need to decode a rough letter to determine where to begin the physical part of the adventure. Suffice to say, about 60 miles east of San Diego, in the desert mudflats, sits an underground tunnel that you must traverse, followed by a short hike over stifling desert to reach the geocache. 
of course, I have the listing on my watch list because it's such an amazing experience and it's found on average maybe three times a year tops. Before I was vlogging, I put together a video of the adventure that you can watch at cashtheline.net slash Tomb Raider. <laughs> but recently, Balkan Thez, the fossil lady and notable find, found it, and I thought notable find's log was a most excellent recap of the experience. She says, Balkan Thez had done all the hard puzzle solving on this one, and we headed out towards the mud caves. After reading all of the previous logs, I was worried about our ultimate well-being. I gave some friends the latitude and longitude in case I didn't return. I packed necessary items such as a headlamp, water, food, and a kerchief tied around my neck which proved to be invaluable later on. We found the mouth of the cave and put on our gear. Walking up, there was a cool breeze coming out of it. Turning on our light sources, into the darkness we went. The air was cool compared to the warmth of the desert. Balkanthez took the lead and I was in the middle followed by the fossil lady. I pulled my kerchief over my mouth. There was minute dust being kicked up by our plodding along. The kerchief worked as a makeshift mask and I was glad to be wearing it. The caves twisted and turned. We continued on and on, probably about a thousand feet into the darkness. Below us, on ledges on the floors, there were moth wings scattered about. I thought of the many bats that must live in this protected home and the leftovers from tasty meals that they had been devouring. I made clicking sounds with my tongue and the roof of my mouth. The bats thought it was the sound of an insect and would come swooping towards my head. I tried to get pictures, but all I got was a blur. Sometimes the cave got narrow and we had to contort our bodies in order to get through the tight spots. I bumped my head a number of times and finally there was a patch of light ahead and we all breathed a sigh of relief. Once again, Balkanthez led the way up to the top. The ground was extremely soft. Little mud landslides were created, kicking up a lot of fine dust. I tightened the kerchief around my nose and mouth and was thankful that I had thought to bring it. Warning to others, don't do this one alone. The fine mud tube leading up to the surface is extremely unstable. Finally, victory was achieved and travel bugs were collected. What an achievement. This was definitely a 5-5. We collectively sighed, a big sigh of relief, drove back to Borrego Springs and had a much deserved margarita. Thanks for keeping this one alive, Dak girls. This is a memory that will last a lifetime. I fully agree with that. <laughs> I will never forget. That was my very first 5-5, and it was risky, and she captured quite a few aspects to that adventure that uh, that, that stuck out in my mind, except we didn't get the, the bats and moth wings uh, on our walk through that cave. But, uh, oh man, that was a memorable time. If you ever want an adventurous desert cache to find, bookmark GCWD13. Thanks again to the Dak Girls for keeping this one going since 2006. Last month we explored a very remote, borderline unfound geocache on a very small, barely inhabited island four kilometers from the Russian border. Well, then I came across another island that's considered the most remote inhabited island or archipelago and there are a whopping six geocaches there <laughs> you might prefer to visit this if you were on a cruise or a tropical vacation but you can also get to it from Cape Town in South Africa by ship the island is Tristan da Cunha and it sits in the middle of the South Atlantic Sea it's a British overseas territory those six geocaches are all sitting around the city of Edinburgh of the seven seas which lies at the base of a volcano Queen Mary's Peak reaches just over 2,000 meters, which last erupted in 1961. Sadly, there's no 5.5 geocache of any type sitting at the peak <clears throat> yet, though many do make the trek to reach the summit. If you look on the satellite imagery of the mountain close enough, at the summit you can find Queen Mary's Lake, and that's a heart-shaped crater lake. You can find the island quickly with one of the cache codes, GC6NTT8, that's for the one called the Old Flagpole. One thing is for sure, it is a gorgeous island and could make one heck of a vacation. If you've been subscribed to Cash the Line on YouTube for a few years, you may remember a video I published from a road trip to the first Giga Geo Woodstock in North America, where I joined forces with friends and vloggers to tackle a touristy, tasty series of stops called the Butler County Donut Trail. 
It was both a tourist trail to visit the shops, but also a geotour with geocaches hidden at each of the stops. If you find the geocaches and stamp your passport, you'd earn yourself an official Butler County Donut Trail geotour geocoin. <laughs> That's a lot. Well, Ohio is at it again. This time, Seneca County is getting in on the action. They're launching a pizza trail. Well, that's right, 19 pizza spots in the county have teamed up for a touristy adventure, and they have created a special series of geocaches for this brand new adventure. And apart from getting to chow down on all the best pizza in the county, I would assume, if you complete six locations in the trail passport, you can earn a free t-shirt. But if you tick off all 19 locations, you'll earn the slice of Seneca County geocoin. Go check out the show notes for links to the homepage for the passport, and a bookmark list of all of the geocache stops in the series. Better get your appetite ready. On the donut trail, I had a bite of at least one donut at every stop on the trail. I wonder if anybody could do the same with all the pizza stops on this trail. Hmm. It is time for the Patron Adventurer of the Month. Cash the Line is supported by a band of excellent adventurers through Patreon who graciously pitch in and help the channel and podcast, making it all possible for the content to be published freely for you. And for this show, our patron adventurer of the month is The Pizza Ninja. He's been a most excellent supporter and a recognizable name in the online geocaching community. He's a part of the Geocache Talk Network, helping with social media and co-hosting some shows, but he's also a great influence in the community. And he's the best ninja of pizzas around. <laughs> Also, I'm pretty sure the new Seneca County Pizza Geo Tour is on his bucket list. <laughs> Thanks so much to the Pizza Ninja. I'm grateful for your ongoing support of Cash the Line. You too can help support CTL and unlock bonus content and swag, like the upcoming 2023 Cash the Line patron exclusive path tag, and participation in the upcoming Project EGA game. Just visit patreon.com slash cash the line, patreon.com slash cash the line. Thank you so much for your support. The spot is a geocache in New York. It's GC39 and is currently the sixth oldest active geocache in the world and fourth oldest in the United States, placed in May of 2000. Being so old, the container's been replaced over its lifetime, but recently the cache owner GPS Fool was able to revisit the geocache and complete what he's wanted to do for some time. And here's what he said in his maintenance log. I visited the cache today, 23 years and two days since I originally placed this cache. Who would have guessed it would still be going strong after all these years? I hear it's like the sixth oldest cache still running? As for myself, 23 years older, a bit heavier and way more out of shape. My last visit was three to four years ago. My goal for today was to put back in place the ammo box container originally used for this cache. During my last visit three to four years ago, I swapped in a temporary box, allowing me to take the ammo box home for needed maintenance. The hinge had broken such that the box no longer sealed. This original box is back in place as of today, May 28, 2023, with a fixed hinge and a new coat of paint. I also added a new logbook for signing. The substitute box, a plastic box with snap-tight lid, was small enough, so I just placed it into the ammo box. Other observation, lots of trail erosion since I placed this cache 23 years ago. Many herd paths too. Seems to me too that the hills have got steeper? <laughs> he goes on to say that the real original container was actually a 5 gallon bucket, but it had issues with the lid screwing on, freezing shut, or just not shutting properly, which eventually led to it filling with water and being swapped for the ammo can. And it's been there ever since, or until recently when swapped out for maintenance. Even the original logbook is stored safely in a fireproof safe. So there is a geocache that will take you back to the real good old days with the original container and fill a square on your Jasmine grid. Plus, it's a beautiful hike, and you can check out my video of going to the spot at cachetheline.net slash the spot. Our world of artificially intelligent geocaching just got a touch thespian. 
This post from White Man has our AI buddy telling of a geocaching adventure, but in a Shakespearean style. <clears throat> in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, there lived a merry band whose hearts were keen. But twas no sword they wielded, nor lance of yore, for they pursued a treasure in nature's store. Geocaching was their game, a quest untold, where GPS devices became their gold. In secret spots tucked within the land, caches lay hidden waiting for their hand. Our tale begins with young Sebastian True, a lad of wit and vigor keen to pursue. With compass true and heart aflame with glee, he ventured forth his spirit wild and free. Through verdant forests and meadows wide, Sebastian roamed by nature's call defied. He scanned the landscape seeking out the prize, with every step anticipation would arise. O oh, fortune, guide me to the hidden gem, that I may bask in glories yet to stem. His voice a whisper, carried by the breeze, beseeching nature's secrets to appease. And lo, his GPS device did sing, a signal strong like melody in spring. He followed its song with nimble feet, a treasure trove he hoped soon to meet. Through labyrinthine trails he trekked along, the hours waned, but still his spirit strong. He navigated thorny paths and shaded glens, searching for where the secret cache begins. Then with a gasp his eyes beheld the sight, a hidden chest, a gleaming beacon bright. With trembling hands he gently prized it free, a moment's pause before he dared to see. Within the chest a note from ages past, penned by another seeker whose time was cast. We share this bond through worlds apart, may your joy in geocaching. And so Sebastian, filled with heartfelt cheer, replaced the note, then whispered, I was here. With newfound purpose, he set out once more to hide his own cache, to add to the lore. For geocaching, a game of joy and glee, connects us all in its vast tapestry. Through nature's embrace, we wander free, bound by the treasures it conceals with glee. Thus let us celebrate this game we play, with compass in hand we seek the caches lay. In Shakespearean spirit we embark anew, geocaching, a treasure hunt for me and you. Now, speaking of our AI friend, it needs a name. So I'm opening the floor to you and making it a contest. If you have an idea for a name for our AI geo friend, send it in, and if I pick your name, I'll send you two Cash the Line pens, in case you lose one, of course, and a bit of bonus swag. So think of something fun and creative and witty, and then email tgif at cashtheline.net with the subject AI Geocacher name. Then let's see what artificial geocaching adventures our AI will take us on next. And here is the monthly Lone Wolf Contest update. Back in 2021, I joined with Cache Canada and a few other friends on an adventurous trek to a remote castle, and published a cache tour video series of a number of geocaches found along the way. Hidden in that series is your chance to become one of 50 people to win a very special prize. And here's a little teaser. There is an exclusive, extremely limited path tag and swag in it for you. It's part of what I'm hoping to launch later this year, a brand new game, part of codename Project EGA. It's a labor of love I've been working on for a few years now, and it's nearing time for it to be revealed. Though you may have seen some graphic teasers over the last few months if you follow Cash the Line on social media. Cash the Line patrons are already in the loop, and we're just given an updated exclusive sneak peek of the game, and development is really progressing. If you'd like to win one of those 50 exclusive prizes that will enhance the game, then here's what you've got to do. Visit the Lone Wolf Legacy video playlist on YouTube that you can find at cashtheline.net slash lonewolf, one word, and watch for special words that are highlighted by a smiley face in all but one of the videos. Once you've got them all, string them all together and visit cashtheline.net slash and append that string of words with no spaces or punctuation and follow the instructions there. The contest won't end until all 50 slots are claimed and there are still a few spots to be claimed. You can find the instructions also listed in the show notes and on the video playlist. I'm expecting to finally reveal the game later this year and I am excited for the day I can share it with you.
let's head over to this month's Cashly Corner. When I'm on the hunt for a cache in a typical forest trail type environment, I sometimes prefer to see the overhead map a few different ways. In Cachely, you have a wide array of map sources to choose from, from Google to Bing and Open Maps, Arc SIS, even a custom map provider that you can set up yourself. So here's a quick tip. I found that there are two types I most often swap between, satellite imagery and offline vectors. Instead of scrolling the list to find the one we want to use each time, Cashly gives you the ability to quickly swap between favorite map sets. While tapping the layer icon on any map view lets you choose a map source, if you tap and hold on that icon, you can quickly select back to one of the last three sources you've used. For me, that tends to be Cashly's fantastic offline maps for Ontario, Google Satellite, and Google's Roadmap. That tap and hold quick swap is a nice touch to avoid scrolling through the extensive map source list when you just want to either see the trees and water around you or the lines of marked trail systems to get to the cache faster or back to parking ASAP. <laughs> Thanks to Cashly for sponsoring this episode. It is my go-to geocaching app and I would say the best app on iOS by far. It's unsurpassed by any other geocaching app. It features in quality and the app alone is worth a few bucks for its features. I highly recommend this app, whether you're a veteran geocacher or just starting out in the activity. Find it in the App Store or by visiting www.cashly.com, C-A-C-H-L-Y.com. If you have any adventures you'd love to share on the show, I would love to hear from you. If you have any comments, funny stories, milestones, accomplishments, rants, and adventures to share, please email tgif at cashtheline.net or phone one in by calling to leave a message at www.cashtheline.net slash POI. Links and references mentioned in this episode can be found in the show notes linked in the description. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give this show a thumbs up or a positive review. If you'd like to join the band of excellent adventurers who help support Cash the Line, please find us on Patreon or by visiting cashtheline.net slash Patreon. You too can support for as little as a cup of coffee per month or with a discount by the year and get bonus swag and access to exclusive content. See you next month with more exploration into the wide world of excellent geocaching adventures. Please subscribe, follow, share with your friends, and comment wherever you're able. And as always... Happy caching and excellent adventuring.